Okay, so we are recording now. All right. All right, so it is a pleasure to introduce Dr. Zosha Kruzberg, a dear friend and colleague who comes today to us uh, from Chicago. Zosha and I have known each other for a little over a decade since our days as fellow graduate students at the University of Chicago. From our Chicago days, Zosha's passion for education was clear to many of us. After completing her PhD at U Chicago in cosmology, and Zosha did her um, thesis, I think, on maverick dark matter, which was, you know, something that, you know, very cute and nice topic. Um, Dr. Kruzberg taught for several years at Vassar College. After Vassar, Dr. Kruzberg became part of the instructional faculty at Yale University where her work bridging the gap between the Department of Physics and the Center for Teaching and Learning was supported by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Post her role at Yale and after a brief stint as an Associate Professor of Instruction at Northwestern University, Dr. Kruzberg went full circle back to Chicago. She now serves as the Director of Graduate Studies in the Department of Physics at the University of Chicago. Dr. Kruzberg has a vast background in physics and astronomy education and currently leads an interdisciplinary research program in mind, brain, and education. Today, Dr. Kruzberg will tell us all about her experiences in classical physics and somatic meditation. Take it away. Thank you so much, Bujo. Um, and uh, I know this is a little bit of a, a sensitive issue for, for some people, but if you can leave your video on, um, please do. It's, it's really nice for me to see your faces and I absolutely will not be insulted if you're eating dinner or having a glass of wine or anything like that. Um, but it's nice to see, <laughs> but it's nice to see you. And if you can't, that's also perfectly okay. And if you need to go in and out, that's also perfectly fine. Like Bujo said, if you would like to interrupt with comments or questions at any time, please do so. Um, I have two screens um, with my presentation here on the left, and I'll try to pay attention to your waving hands or uh, your raising hand um, option. So to see if, um, if any of you wanna interject, but certainly feel free to speak up at any time. Um, I, I, I hope that what I'll tell you about today is um, at least somewhat thought provoking and um, uh, I, I encourage you to question what, what, I'll, what I'll tell you about. So um, thank you, Bujo, so much for inviting me. It's, it's really a pleasure to, first of all, to connect with Bujo. Um, as he said, we were uh, good friends uh, here in Chicago when we were in graduate school together. Um, I certainly admired him from the first day that I met him as probably the brightest person in our class. Um, and he would always turn in these impeccable problem sets to uh, in all of our courses that he wrote in pen on unlined paper, and they were impressive to all of us. And um, it's just wonderful to, to connect uh, with him and, and see what wonderful things he's doing with, with you all. So, um, so thanks again for that. So uh, what I'm going to talk to you about today is, uh, as Bujo said, classical physics and somatic meditation the role of contemplative practice in integrating formal theory and personal experience in the undergraduate physics curriculum. I will speak from my experience as a physicist, but I, I hope that you'll see that this is broadly applicable in uh, science education in general. Um, and in fact, you know, looking over your affiliations, engineering, nursing, um, it, really anything, um, contemplative practices have the potential to play an important role in a lot of different fields. So what I thought I would do today is um, I divided my talk into two parts. Um, in the first part, I'm gonna tell you a little bit kind of about uh, the motivation behind this work and, and where I'm coming from, what my history is to kind of make sense and contextualize the work that I'm doing and then talk specifically about some of the research and some of the findings that um, we've, uh, we've come up with in the last few years. So I'm gonna start actually with, uh, uh, let me just minimize here so I can see. Uh, what my what my next slide is. <clears throat> so I'm going to start with a photo here um, that I hope you'll appreciate. This is um, a, a family photo of my lineage. Um, this is uh, my my little sister and I with my mother um, in in our mother's lap, my grandmother all the way to the left, and my great grandmother in the middle. Um, this is in in Sweden. I'm from Sweden. And um, first of all, I really like this picture because it's where I come from. Um, but another funny thing about this is that 
only a couple of years after this picture was taken, um, my mother gave me a blackboard, small blackboard, probably no more than about, um, about a foot long, um, that she had received from her mother, my grandmother, when she was about five years old. And this blackboard became one of my most prized possessions. And I started <laughs> very early on to create lessons on this blackboard for my little sister, who's two years younger than me. And not only did I have little lessons on the blackboard, and to be honest, I can't remember what these lessons were about, if they were about characters and the stories we were reading or whatever. But soon afterwards, I would create these little worksheets that I would give her that I would grade with a red marker. <laughs> um, and I'm telling you this because it is really true that at least for me, teaching was something that I was meant to do from, from almost birth. And so it started that early. I came to the United States for college. Um, this is the main library at Dartmouth College. And at college, I studied um, physics and astronomy, as well as Middle Eastern studies, and particularly Arabic. Um, I had lived uh, for part, part of my childhood in, in Egypt. My parents were, were Swedish diplomats, and so I was really fascinated by that part of the world, the language, the culture, the religion. Um, and so that was part of my studies. And alongside these studies, what I, what I did was I almost immediately started teaching. Um, at, at Dartmouth. Um, first, I, I started off as a grader in the physics department. I then moved on to become an undergraduate teaching assistant. Um, I also served as a teaching assistant in the uh, Rossius Foundation, which teaches languages to uh, not only students at Dartmouth College, but also English language learners. So recent immigrants who needed instruction in English, as well as adult learners who needed to learn um, another language for um, as part of their work or travel or whatever it might be. So um, it was clear for me that teaching was gonna be a, a big part of my life. And um, another thing that I did very, that I began very early on in my college um, experience was I started working here. Um, this is a picture of um, a correctional facility in Vermont. Um, so uh, Dartmouth is located right at the border between New Hampshire and Vermont. And this looks probably what, what you think a correctional facility would look like in Vermont. It looks a little bit just like a farm. Um, and in fact, it was a little bit of a farm. There were these little greenhouses and I think there, was, there were even chickens. Um, there was a wood shop. There was, um, I think there was a bicycle repair shop. I mean, all kinds of uh, wonderful things for the inmates. It was a minimum security prison. Um, and what I did was I worked with a lot of the inmates there. It was an all-male uh, prison um, working to help them um, study for the, the GED. And so I, I helped them with mathematics um, study as well as uh, just teaching them a little bit of physics and astronomy because especially astronomy I found was something that was really interesting to a lot of, um, a lot of the inmates. So as I finished up as an undergraduate, I realized that I, I wanted to learn more about teaching and learning um, and how the mind works and how the mind um, learns and sort of what both from a psychological, cognitive science and neurological perspective, how learning works. So I went on after that to um, Harvard University. This is the main library at Harvard um, and um, got, a, got a degree there in, um, in education and in mind brain and education. And it was a really fascinating year for me to, um, you know, I I'd, I'd mainly focused on, on physics re research up until that point, but to really think about um, how we learn physics and how we conceptualize a lot of the things that we just kind of um, do in physics, or how the mind really makes sense of all those things. So um, uh, again, there, I've, I've always been very interested in social justice issues. And so there I um, did some work in some of the uh, inner city public schools in, in Boston and in Cambridge and worked with, um, especially students who were really struggling um, in the sciences and um, found that that really pushed kind of that theoretical study of learning um, alongside kind of the, the, the practical element. So, um, once I was done with that, um, I, I came to Chicago, uh, where of course I met Bujo. And, um, and here is the, the main library at, at the University of Chicago. I'm, I'm literally just four blocks away from there right now. 
And um, I like this image because it has Carlin Linnaeus, um, who's a Swedish, uh, a Swedish um, biologist who, of course, um, as some of you may know, came up with a classification system for, uh, for plants in particular. And so at uh, the University of Chicago, we, uh, we struggled through our <laughs> classes, our acquired classes. Um, and I really enjoyed the research that I was doing, which was in, um, as Bujo said, in um, theoretical cosmology and, and particle phenomenology. And however, again, I found that um, the teaching part was missing a little bit for me. And so I got involved in a lot of different um, outreach projects, uh, a lot of extra teaching kind of projects. Uh, one, I'm, I'm gonna show you one image here. This is a, a group of uh, kids from, uh, from the south side of Chicago um, that are part of the, the Chicago public school system that we took up to uh, a historical observatory up in um, Wisconsin for about a week in the summer. And we, we taught them astronomy and uh, we had these uh, special themes um, that we would kind of center all of our, our, all of our activities around. And a funny story is you see the really blonde person, that's me, my hair was a lot blonder than there's a little kid sitting next to me who looks to be about five feet tall. Um, he's now about six foot five. His name is Freddie, and he's actually a really good friend of mine, and he's here at Chicago still. Um, so I always love seeing him in these pictures. Um, but so I, so I worked with uh, middle and high school students um, uh, at, uh, here from the south side of Chicago. I also did a lot of teaching of um, elementary and middle school science teachers. Uh, students transitioning into college from um, underprepared backgrounds and um, all kinds of things like that. So it, I, I really enjoyed the kind of multitude of uh, populations that I had taught. You know, everything from 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 young children, middle school, um, middle school and high school students, um, undergraduate students, and up to this point in my life now, graduate students. Um, as well as adult learners and, and, and again, working with teachers and faculty members at universities, um, as well as um, people from, who really come from underserved um, backgrounds and have ended up in our correctional facilities and who really need um, a, a good solid grounding and, and, um, and, and good teaching to be able to, to move forward in their lives um, once they're, they're, they're back out in the world. So um, here is a, a picture of my, my dissertation, uh, Buja Remembered Correctly, The Phenomenology of Maverick Dark Matter was the title of my dissertation. Um, and I just wanted to use this as a sort of transitional slide um, to, to say two things. The first is that it became very clear to me as I was finishing up my PhD that I wasn't going to go the traditional route of getting a postdoc and then a traditional sort of research tenure track kind of position uh, because I, I really did enjoy my research a lot and I'm still engaged in, in some of my physics research though not very much, but to me it wasn't meaningful enough and it wasn't connected enough to, to sort of society and people and people's needs um, and uh, particularly sort of underserved um, people in our communities so that was one issue. So I knew that I would go on in a, to, to, to teach um, really in some kind of capacity. That was the first thing. And the second thing was, um, you know, something that was at the time felt very, um, like a very sensitive issue, which was my mental health as a graduate student. Um, and at the time, you know, as I was finishing up my, my degree, I realized that I was really suffering from, um, kind of serious um, depression and anxiety. And I was really ashamed of this. And I felt like I wasn't um, like tough enough really for, for academia. And it was a really, it's been a really interesting experience now as director of graduate studies. And I work, you know, to, I oversee our graduate program and I work very closely with all of our graduate students. And I realized how common this phenomenon is among graduate students. Um, you know, there's tremendous pressure in our program to be successful, to do well, both in courses, which is a little bit silly because nobody ever looks at your grades in graduate courses. So it's kind of a self-inflicted thing, um, you know, but also to impress our advisors, impress our collaborators. And, um, you know, we're very well aware that there aren't that many academic uh, positions for us. So there seems to be this kind of extreme competition. 
And so, so students are really um, struggling often with mental health issues. And this was something that, that, um, that I learned about myself as, as a grad student, just as I was finishing up. So I mentioned this first because I think um, just kind of, it's important for us to talk about that. Um, but also because what it led me to was um, certainly taking care of my own mental health and was part, well, and, and, and one of the parts of that was starting uh, a regular meditation practice. And um, so I'm gonna show you here a picture from, um, from a, a meditation center in Crestone, Colorado uh, that I go to regularly on meditation retreat. Um, I haven't been recently, I have a 10 month old son and of course it's not extremely conducive to going on meditation retreat, but, um, but uh, spent, you know, since I finished grad school between sort of four to eight weeks a year in meditation retreat. And I realized that meditation had this tremendous power in helping us work with um, our experience, um, the, the challenges in our everyday lives, and um, kind of uh, seeing joy, seeing joy in, in, in everyday life. So meditation became a huge part of my own sort of recovery, um, but also just, um, just working with, um, with my life in a day-to-day -day sort of way. So after I left Chicago, I went to Vassar College uh, here's, um, I'm sorry, I'm, uh, if they're architecture people, maybe you'll appreciate the, the nice uh, building pictures that I'm showing you. So this is the main library at, at Vassar College, which is in, um, in, in uh, upstate New York, according to New Yorkers, but really downstate New York. Um, and um, I show you this picture too, because once I arrived at Vassar, um, I had started meditating regularly and uh, actually the teacher training in meditation so um, up on the third level from that um, gate to the library was uh, what we call the quiet room. And in the quiet room, I led weekly meditation classes for, um, for faculty, for students, for community members in Poughkeepsie. And it was a wonderful way to uh, connect with the community. And in fact, that extended beyond just the Vassar community. And I started teaching here. Um, so this is a little bit of a contrast to the prison that was in uh, Vermont. This is Dutchess County Jail in Poughkeepsie, which unfortunately is often ranked among sort of the five worst jails in all of uh, New York State. Um, but I worked with some of the, the women um, in, the, in the jail uh, teaching them meditation, and many of them were suffering from um, addiction issues and um, were really struggling with meditation, but it was a really nice way to, to connect with them. So um, I actually continued teaching meditation. Um, here is the, the Buddha shrine um, at Yale. And um, I've been teaching here at the University of Chicago as well, oh, as well as Northwestern where um, I just came from. So I mention all of this because um, hopefully through what I've just told you, it has become a little bit more clear how this connection may have emerged for me between physics and contemplative practice and, and meditation in particular. And in fact, when I was at Vassar, I discovered something. So, you know, on the one hand, I was teaching um, physics classes as part of the physics faculty. And, and Bujo and I were just talking about this yesterday that the physics department at Vassar was really small. There were about um, five physics faculty and maybe an additional two or three astronomy faculty beyond that. Um, and so we taught a lot, just like you all do. If, if you're if you're teaching, we had a three-two teaching load, and um, and it was a lot. So so we taught basically all of the courses in the curriculum, and then on the on the other side, you know, I was also teaching meditation, and so I became really curious because I saw all the benefits that meditation was having um, in this, these people that were showing up to my weekly meditation sessions, and they were telling me about how this was impacting their lives, their experience, and how they were really. Um, able to work with kind of challenging situations that they arose, that as they arose, um, how they became much more aware of their own thinking patterns, their emotional patterns. And I thought, well, you know, this is really fascinating, actually. And I wonder if there's some way that you could bring meditation practice in a secular way into the classroom for its cognitive benefits. And what I soon discovered was that there's actually an entire organization dedicated to exploring these kinds of questions. Um, and it's called the Association for Contemplative Mind in Higher Education. 
and um, it's specifically dedicated to these kinds of questions. And they run yearly um, conferences, um, summer workshops, there are grants. I mean, there's all kinds of pieces to it. And so of course I got uh, connected with, with that group and um, started to explore you know, what was possible in terms of integrating these kinds of practices into the physics curriculum. As a side note, um, it was interesting because there's, there was also a woman um, alumna from Vassar, so Vassar College used to be um, a, an all women's college. And there's a very prominent alumna um, who was a dancer named Carolyn Grant. And she actually established a fund at Vassar. You know, this was very um, auspicious in a way um, she established a grant there for people who, who wanted to explore these kinds of issues and specifically around embodiment and the traditional classroom. Um, and I think a lot of people, both in the Association for Contemplative Mind and, and the people behind Carolyn Grant are recognizing that traditional college education is extremely disembodied. Um, it's also highly theoretical and abstract and quite disconnected from our everyday experience. And we're often asked as students to, um, at least in the sciences, I can't speak for the humanities as much, but certainly in the sciences to ignore or even reject our own experiences, our own intuition in favor of kind of what the formal theories in the field might be. And this can be a real struggle. And from a cognitive science perspective, it doesn't make much sense because we know there that it's actually um, extremely important to acknowledge existing conceptions in order to build new conceptions. And this is um, kind of a whole field of, of uh, learning called constructivism. So from many different perspectives, this isn't, this isn't an ideal way of doing things, but it's also not clear how we uh, might do things differently. So let me transition into kind of the research part of this, um, this talk. So I want to give credit to some of my um, collaborators and the, the work that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, Meredith Ward, a former student of mine, um, who is now doing a, um, a degree in clinical social work at Smith College, um, is an extremely thoughtful and creative uh, woman. And um, it's been a, a, a really tremendous pleasure to work with her over the years. Uh, Kalei Larson, currently at MIT. Elam Colson is my husband, and those of you who have um, uh, partners who are in academia know that uh, a lot of our work um, happens over sort of the, the, the breakfast table, um, you know, metaphorically speaking, and he's helped out a lot, and especially in the connections um, between physics and, and medicine and chemistry and biology, um, where, where I don't know very much, and, and he's, a, he's an expert. And then Andrew Feldman is a current student um, working with me, who's at Northwestern in the Cognitive Science program there. So a, a lot of the people who work um, in my group are um, actually not physicists. They're often uh, cognitive science uh, students or, or faculty members, um, uh, neuroscience, um, as well as some physics, um, physics people. <clears throat> so I wanna give uh, credit to, um, to a, a few different groups. Uh, the main one um, is, is really the, the many students that have um, been extremely open-minded with me because I have given them some pretty crazy assignments in my classes and they've been extremely open-minded and willing to to just go with it and have given me tremendous feedback on a lot of this work. So I think uh, they always deserve a little bit of a shout out. So here, here are the things that I'd like to talk about. Um, I'd like to give you just a little bit of, uh, of an introduction um, in terms of what is it that we're trying to do in physics education. And again, if you're not in physics, it doesn't really matter because I think you'll see the connections here with, with your respective fields. Um, uh, I'll then tell you a little bit about the specific practices that we've developed um, in our group, um, what, they, what they look like, what, what students are told, asked to, to do, um, as well as the feedback that we've gotten um, from these students and just uh, a brief discussion about um, what, what some of the uh, potential benefits of, of contemplative practices in, in our science classes might be. So let me begin here with um, the objectives of physics education. And again, if you're not a physicist, think you can think about this a little bit from your perspective, but <clears throat> I would say that the objectives of physics education broadly fall into three categories. Um, the first one, probably the most important one, 
which is kind of the physics itself. We hope that our students come away from our classes knowing certain fundamental concepts. So in physics, it would be understanding what is acceleration, what is energy, you know, what is um, electric potential, whatever it may be. Problem solving skills. In, in physics, expertise is largely defined by an ability to solve problems. So obviously we want our, phys our students to come away from our physics classes with specific problem solving skills, um, as well as experimental techniques. And you know, we often send students to the lab to kind of learn how to collect data, how to make hypotheses, how to analyze data, how to draw conclusions, how to devise follow-up experiments, that kind of thing. So again, maybe the central objective to physics courses is, is just that. But there are a lot of other, and kind of maybe this is what we sometimes refer to as the hidden curriculum. Uh, that's not necessarily on our syllabus, but certainly still is important. So physics in context, how is physics connected to other STEM fields, other scientific fields? How is it connected to human society? And this can range from how is, does it connect to, um, to, to um, politics or history or art, uh, any, any, any number of different fields, and also personal experience. We would hope that um, scientific study helps us make sense of our experience as embodied beings um, in, in this, this physical world that we find ourselves in. And then finally, um, we, we hope that our students will take away from our classes some kind of knowledge of themselves as learners. Um, and this is what we often refer to as metacognition and meta-affect. And since I've introduced new terms, I'm just gonna define them here uh, for those of you who haven't heard them before. Metacognition is uh, an awareness of one's cognitive states and processes. Um, a more colloquial way of saying that would be understanding one's own thinking, right? Affect is another word for emotion, motivation, and, and mood. So meta-affect then is an awareness of those affective states and processes. So maybe an understanding, uh, you know, just a, again, a very real example, some students thrive when they get a problem that really challenges them. Some students get super excited and they just can't wait to dig in. And it doesn't matter if they fail and fail and fail, they just wanna keep figuring it out. You know, those are probably the students who end up staying in science. And there are other students who will just get feel terrified and self and, and self judge and think they don't belong and sad and, and angry potentially at themselves. So kind of understanding um, what are we, um, how do we feel in response to um, specific learning in, um, in our science classrooms. So the work that, that I've been working on for the last few years is uh, specifically here um, around um, the relationship between physics and personal experience. So let me make a really broad general statement, which is that in, in all, this is um, anecdotal. From my experience teaching, and I've taught, as I, as I said earlier, I've taught really wide range of populations from young children to, to adults, um, you know, with all kinds of different backgrounds, with all kinds of different motivations for being in my classes. And, and one thing has always been true, and that is that there's tremendous value to making room for students' unique personal experience in the classroom. There isn't often a lot of room for that. We don't often ask our students, hey, where is this landing for you? How do you feel about this? How does it connect to what you've learned before or your, your previous feelings about physics or chemistry or mathematics? Lots of students, as, you, as, as many of you probably know, are terrified of mathematics. Many have been told that they're, they suck at math. And like, why? There's no reason for that because most people can be taught to do mathematics. And getting a negative comment like that can discourage a student forever. But that kind of experience, if you make room for it in the classroom and you acknowledge it, that can make a huge difference for a student. That like you just say, wow, that must have been really terrible for you to, to have been told that you suck in this field. And that must make you really discouraged. Um, in my class, as you know, as a physics class, if you feel like you can't do mathematics. And I, I think probably many of you who teach will agree with me that, that there isn't always enough room made for students to share their, their personal experience. So this is kind of a, a, a very general statement. 
I'm going to focus this statement a little bit more um, to make it specific to physics. And to do that, I'm going to share with you some, um, some research results. There is a, a um, survey called the MPEX. And the survey probes students, um, it basically makes certain statements that students can agree or disagree with. And then you give it to students at the beginning of a semester, at the beginning of a course, and then at the end of the course. And the, the items that I'm gonna share with you have to do with the relationship between what is learned in an introductory physics class. And we're talking here about a mechanics class, right? So we're studying the motion of cars, airplanes, basketballs, you know, things that are everywhere in our experience. So here are the, here are the statements. I'm gonna just read the statements on the left first. So the item, the first item is physical laws have little relation to what I experience in the real world. The second one is to understand physics. I sometimes think about my personal experiences and relate them to the topic being analyzed. And the third one is learning physics helps me understand situations in my everyday life, right? So very reasonable statements. Now the next two columns are favorable pre and favorable post. So this is basically saying, do you agree with the statement before you take the course? And then do you agree with the statement after you take the course? Now, please just pause for a moment and look at these numbers and I'll contextualize them in a second. So physical laws have little relation to what I experience in the real world. Most people agree with the statement before the course, but even more people agree with the statement after they take the course. Now, this is introductory classical mechanics, which is absolutely 100% related to the things that you experience in your everyday life, right? Like how fast is your car moving? What does it feel like to accelerate in an airplane? Those kinds of things are 100% applicable, but somehow the students feel like, actually, you know what, what I learned in my physics class is not applicable to my everyday life. The next one goes from 59% uh, to think that it's valuable to think about my personal experience and relating it to the topics being covered. Fewer believe that after the course is over, but the last one is really shocking and I'm gonna highlight it because here learning physics helps me understand situations in my everyday life. 72% of students agree at the beginning of a course, only 50% of students agree after the course. So I'm seeing some like people are shaking their heads a little bit. Like it's really shocking actually. What is it that we're doing wrong in our physics classes? And I'm not giving any biologists or chemists out there. I don't have data for you, but don't feel like you got away like easily because I'm sure, you know, it's probably similar in, in your courses, but we're obviously doing something wrong in our physics classes. If students come away from the experience thinking, you know what, this doesn't, this doesn't help me understand the physical world around me. We're not doing an adequate job connecting theoretical concepts with personal experience. And again, personal experience is like, I'm going out to shoot hoops with my friends in the basketball court outside my school, right? Like these are, these are we're not talking about anything more, more insane than that. So, I found out about this, you know, as part of just studying education uh, when I was at Harvard. Um, and, and suddenly, after beginning uh, a regular meditation practice, I realized, oh, but this is really interesting because meditation practice is all about attending to one's personal experience. And, and it certainly begins with one's inner experience, right? Like, wow, my left toe is really uncomfortable. and. Oh, it's my, my breath feels really cool um, on the out breath. I mean, it, it's things like that. But part of that a, a attention that you're giving to your inner experience extends outward as well. So it seemed to me that maybe contemplative practices that are, um, and let me define them here actually first. So contemplative practices are practices with an internal, introspective, and reflective first person focus that foster an awareness of the present experience. It seemed like maybe contemplative practices could play a role in bridging this divide between theory and experience, the abstract and the experiential. Um, for those of you, so meditation, obviously here comes my cat. Um, you wanna say hi to everybody? Um, so 
meditation is, you know, probably the, the most, um, the practice that comes to mind the most when we talk about contemplative practices, but there are really countless different contemplative practices. And I'm gonna show you a figure here on the next slide that's from the Association for Contemplative Mind that I mentioned earlier. And as you can see, it really ranges. Uh, and most people are, um, you know, take part in some kind of a contemplative practice as part of their lives, whether it's an explicitly religious practice like prayer um, or meditation, uh, but it really um, extends beyond that. So, um, so, so starting kind of at the bottom left and moving around, meditation, silence, centering, then moving to visualization, beholding, music and singing, journaling, the contemplative arts, uh, work and volunteering. So, you know, a really uh, a deep listening, storytelling, uh, a lot of the kind of movement-based practices like yoga and dance, uh, qigong, uh, tai chi, these kinds of practices all fall into the category of contemplative practices. And, um, and for me, the most important one is meditation. I'm also a yoga practitioner, um, but uh, when we talk about integrating contemplative practices in higher education, we're really talking about this wide range of practices. So um, at this point, let me tell you then a little bit about the, the purpose behind this work. So first of all, uh, one of the goals is um, has been to introduce the science education community and especially the physics education community to contemplative practices, offering a collection of contemplative practices for classical physics courses. And by the way, uh, if you're a physicist, we're also thinking about the role of contemplative practice in, in non-classical physics. So in modern physics, uh, things like quantum mechanics and, and relativity, what could be the role of contemplative practices there as well? Um, determining if such practices help deepen students' awareness of that connection between fundamental physics principles and personal experience, and then exploring potential other benefits of these kinds of practices. So let's, uh, let me tell you a little bit about the, um, the, the practices themselves. And I'm just going to show you a quote here because, um, because I like it a lot. It's a, a, a quote by Goethe and uh, states that every object well contemplated creates an organ for its perception. You can think about that tonight when you go to bed. So the practices, many of the practices that we've developed, and we're going to share a few of them today with you, um, have at their core a somatic meditation. So somatic means uh, body-based. And I'm going to show you on the next few slides, I'm going to give you an outline of the somatic meditation that we ask our students to engage in. So we're just going to go through it and then I'll tell you a little bit more about the details. But um, this is based on the work of Reggie Ray, who's actually my meditation teacher, and David Rome, who is a, a, a colleague or friend of his. So here is the, the, the basic outline of the practice is start by stretching out your arms and legs, wiggling your fingers and toes, and loosening up and relaxing your whole body. Then find a comfortable and upright seated position and become aware of your body. After a while, bring your attention to your seat. Feel the weight of your whole body and how it is drawn to the earth. Let your body settle and be at ease. You know, if we had a little bit more time, we would actually just do this. Close your eyes or lower your gaze. Concentrate on your sense of hearing. Be open to any sounds. Sense the space around you, expanding beyond the surrounding environment. Bring your attention into the center of your chest, placing your hand gently over your heart. Note the quality of your presence. And then finally, let your awareness spread throughout your body. Then open your eyes and extend your awareness into the space around you. Experience the vast quality of your awareness. So if you've ever done any kind of meditation practice or you've done any kind of um, mindfulness practice, you know, they're quite popular now, you know, including on university campuses as part of just kind of mental health and well-being um, kind of programs. Uh, you may have seen something like this. If you're a yoga practitioner, you've ever been to a yoga class, this is a huge part of what you do in a yoga class, especially at the end of the yoga class when you're kind of reaping the benefits of your uh, physical practice. So basically, so I wanted to show you this first because this is the kind of somatic meditation part of a lot of these practices. 
So what we do, we've done a few different things, but often these practices are um, given to students in the form of a handout. They are done for um, credit as part of their coursework. The students are told that they will receive full credit on the assignment as long as they do it and kind of give a good faith effort. And um, it doesn't matter what, what um, kind of how they feel about it. We're not gonna judge them, but they, they just have to try it. We ask them, um, so there's usually a contemplation following this um, somatic meditation and following the contemplation, there's a reflection that they have to turn in like a written reflection. And that's what we um, collect. Uh, we we uh, take away all personally identifying information and then we code it for common themes and see kind of what kinds of things um, emerge for students um, in, in doing these practices. So let me tell you sort of what these practices look like. Um, the very first one, the, the, the first contemplative practice that we ever did was a sensory contemplation. So we asked students to, to go outdoors, you know, get away from your room, get away from the library, wherever you're hanging out, go outdoors, turn off your phone. This is like the, the discomfort that students feel with turning off their phones and not just students, like we as faculty members, we're just as guilty. Having to turn off your phone, you sit down in nature and somewhere silent. And then they, they go through the somatic meditation and then the contemplation part is using their physical senses to observe physical phenomena in their surroundings. And then they write about it. And it can be anything from, you know, it's often things like, depends on the campus, but at Vassar it was often they're seeing squirrels running around, they see leaves falling, they feel the warmth of the sun on their bodies, um, they hear noises, you know, far away in the distance, that kind of thing. But the contemplation part is basically just encouraging them to know what they are taking in through their senses. And then they write about it. And, and there's a little bit of an encouragement in the contemplation sort of, you know, do you see any examples of the physics that we've talked about in class in your experience, just sitting on this bench or in the grass or whatever it may be. So that's the first practice. It's the very first one we tried and we were so encouraged by it, but then we kept going. Another one is um, a sort of video essay or a contemplative videography, however you wanna think about it. Um, and we were motivated by a um, field of uh, contemplative photography, which is a, a field that was developed in Buddhism. And here, again, they do a somatic meditation and then they, they go out with their, here they have to use their phones, <clears throat> but they use their phones to record examples of the kinds of phenomena that we discuss in class. And it can be anything from sound, you know, looking for Doppler shifts, um, or it could be waves, uh, it can be light, anything at all, but they're going out and kind of in a, in a contemplative way, looking for these phenomena. A practice that we're, we're, that's um, going to be published soon in the, in, uh, the physics teacher um, is about electrodynamics. So, you know, one of the challenges if you've ever taught electrodynamics is that students feel like electrodynamics is so extremely abstract um, and much more abstract than the mechanics classes that they've probably just taken. So we thought, okay, well, what if, like, can we challenge that somehow? So again, a somatic meditation followed by contemplating electromagnetic phenomena in their surroundings. And what students often find is, of course, there are electromagnetic phenomena everywhere. They just haven't kind of been uh, encouraged to pay attention to them. And in particular, students tend to find examples of, of electromagnetic phenomena in their bodies because we're starting the meditation in the body. So I'll talk more about that shortly. We're currently working on uh, contemplative problem solving. So how can um, a contemplative practice helps students deepen their metacognitive awareness of their own problem solving. So I talked a little bit about metacognition. How can, um, and we know that metacognition plays a really central role in developing problem solving skills. So can a contemplative practice like a somatic meditation help there as well? So these are a few of the practices that we've developed. And so let me show you um, some of, uh, here's the uh, sensory meditation and the contemplative videography. Uh, we integrated these into a number of different courses at Vassar and Yale. Um, we had 190 students carry out the sensory meditation and 81 the contemplative videography. So these, this is what's in, in, 
press. So the uh, contemplating electrodynamics 66 students have carried out. So all of these students then have submitted reflections and we've um, coded their data, their, their reflections for common themes. And I'm now gonna show you what some of those themes are. Some of them were, were um, we expected to see and some of them were a little bit more surprising. Um, and so here um, are the results. I'm gonna show you another quote that I like a lot. And so this is from Solaris. Uh, but what am I going to see? I don't know. In a certain sense, it depends on you. And, and I like this quote because again, this is this is kind of what, I mean, this is very weird research and we had no idea what the students were gonna say in their reflections. Um, and so some of it certainly surprised us. So here's um, the, the first two practices, uh, the, the sensory meditation and the uh, videography. Uh, oh, this is just a sensory meditation. So a sense of physical embodiment and sensory awareness. And this, by the way, is not who experienced it, but who wrote about it in their reflections. And that's the data that we have. So 97% of students actually mentioned a sense of physical embodiment and sensory awareness in their reflections. 77% talked about this, that, that, that they had a deepened awareness of the applicability of formal theory to personal experience. It's not too surprising because we asked them to look for those things, but many of them said, yes, in fact, I do see these connections now between uh, my experience and what we talk about in the classroom. Many of them spoke um, explicitly about a deepened awareness of their own cognitive and emotional processes, so that meta-affect thing. Again, they weren't asked to comment on this. The, the prompt is extremely broad. It just says, talk about your experience. You know, what did you experience carrying out this practice? Many of them said that they had a deepened um, awareness of, of um, what was going on in their minds um, and in their emotions as they were doing this. One of the things that we really appreciated uh, and weren't totally expecting was the number of students who talked about feeling a deepened, um, kind of a, a heightened sense of curiosity. So just by observing these phenomena around them, they became more curious about them. And it was really funny because many students, and again, they weren't asked to do this, listed just long, long lists of questions that they had about what they were observing. And it was from the kind of very, very silly, like how is the squirrel climbing up on the trunk of the tree? Like what, um, how is the friction working there? And how does the musculature and the squirrel work to things that actually like, I can't answer that in my physics classes two things I really could that were kind of extensions of things that we had talked about in class. And it was really their observations of the phenomena out in nature that, um, uh, that caused them to, to ask these questions and they wouldn't have asked them in the classroom. From my perspective, I was really glad to see that many of them talked about feeling somatically relaxed, so relaxed in their bodies, feeling mentally still. I think we all are extremely familiar with the stress and anxiety that comes from modern life um, and certainly in um, stressful fields, uh, the stressful fields that we're in, our students are incredibly anxious and stressed out, not just around school, but what their experiences in their personal lives, their, their home lives. And um, many of them said, wow, like I haven't felt this calm in a really, really long time. Um, and, um, and so that was encouraging. From a physics perspective, uh, we also really appreciated students feeling an intrinsic motivation to, to study physics. Of course, there's a lot of extrinsic motivation for them. They wanna do well in their classes, they wanna get high grades, they wanna go off to do whatever it is they wanna do after school, but they actually felt intrinsically motivated to learn more physics. They said, wow, you know, this actually makes me wanna take more physics classes because I, I, I would like these questions answered somehow. And then just as a side note, um, the recognition of the role of observation in science, which I think we've kind of taken that away um, uh, in a way from um, our university physics classes, because oftentimes these classes are taught in a lecture format. So the students aren't making observations and drawing conclusions based on their observations. They're just receiving kind of information and that's what learning science is to them. So, um, so these were really interesting results. Here are kind of similar results for the, the, the videography, same kinds of themes. So uh, the applicability of formal theory to personal experience, intrinsic motivation, curiosity, that awareness of cognitive and emotional processes. And then here is um, our electrodynamics paper. 
<clears throat> awareness of electromagnetic phenomena was at 95% um, in, in these reflections. One thing that, you know, I'll talk a little bit more about this in a bit, um, awareness of interdisciplinary connections is really important. Uh, we teach science in a very artificially disciplined way in universities, right? You go to your chemistry class and you go to your biology class and you go to your physics class. But of course, all of these fields are, are extremely interconnected and depend on one another, but we don't always talk about that. And the students don't often get a chance to explore that. But if we're specifically asking them, as we did in this case, to look at electromagnetic phenomena, and they realize that those observations naturally made them ask questions about the human body and chemical phenomena, they see that, oh, wow, these phenomena really are intricately linked to one another. Um, that was something that uh, we appreciated as well. I included here at the bottom the skepticism. Um, and let me just say a few words about that. And then I'd like to show you some examples of, of the students' reflections. We were shocked at how few students expressed skepticism about what we were doing. Now, part of this is, of course, with overachieving students, you know, there's a little bit of a, a selection effect here because the students are going to have a hard time telling their professor, like, wow, this is a crap assignment. Even if I tell them beforehand that I'm just going to give them full credit no matter what. I think that you have to be quite bold to explicitly dismiss it. But one thing that we did get quite a lot of, and this is included in the 15%, was, and it was on of the same order of magnitude in the other practices, I just didn't include it in the table, was, you know, when you gave me this assignment, I thought it was going to be a waste of time, but it turned out to actually be really helpful. So students saying that, you know, I did feel initially really skeptical about this for reasons X, Y, and Z, and then I realized that there was something in it for me, and I actually gained something from it. And that was really helpful to get that perspective, because they were willing to share that they had felt skeptical but that um, the experience itself had actually been worthwhile. So if you'll allow me, I'd like to share some of the quotes um, from the student reflections, just because this is kind of um, uh, impersonal. Uh, and I think their, their quotes are actually wonderful. Um, so here's um, an example of the applicability of formal theory to personal experience. So looking again at the crashing of the waves into the rocks, reminded me of the animations of waves interacting with soft boundaries. Since nothing physically pins down the edge of the wave, the wave is able to run up the side of the rock upon contact, and the rock acts as a soft boundary to allow temporary constructive interference within that wave before sending the wave back the opposite direction. It was an insane realization for me. The waves before me literally mirrored the animation from class. So this is some students watching the waves kind of reflect off the rocks up at Northwestern. We had just done uh, that quarter, earlier that quarter we'd studied constructive and destructive interference of waves off um, hard and soft boundaries. If, if, if you're a physics person, you know what that refers to. <clears throat> Here is a interdisciplinary connection. I thought about how electromagnetism drives all the technology that we use from our computers and cell phones to automated hand dryers and doors. I thought about how I learned in biochemistry class that almost everything in life can be reduced down and explained as a flow of electrons, meaning that electricity plays a role in every aspect of our lives, not just in electronics and technology. Here's a student talking about somatic relaxation and mental stillness. It is weird. <laughs> I think we can all relate. It is weird seeing everything so still compared to my usual day's commotion. It is a nice change of pace. I feel like I can really think and soar through my thoughts. I also notice that my body is almost as still as my surroundings. Especially for me, this is highly out of the ordinary. I'm usually always running around or doing something. I think my body is thankful for the peace and calm. And here's another one along the same lines. This practice was an extraordinarily cathartic experience for me. Beginning with the relaxation of my arms, legs, fingers, and toes, I immediately lost all prior stress and completely cleared my mind. Throughout the stage of relaxation, I enjoy maintaining a good posture because it helped me breathe better and feel more balanced. A few more for you. And this is, I find these kinds of comments so touching. 
As a child, I used to be fascinated with my surroundings, but nowadays I found that fascination to have disappeared. I've ceased wondering why something is the way it is. And I find that disappointing. How have I lost that drive? How have I stopped taking the time to take in my surroundings and question why things are, are the way they are? I'm striving to become a scientist, and yet this is the first time I can recall questioning physical phenomena in a long time. Another one. The contemplative practice would never have occurred to me as part of a physics course. After experiencing this practice of meditation and contemplation, however, I now wonder why such exercises are not more commonly encouraged in science courses. By meditating and contemplating my personal connection with electromagnetic phenomena, I found both relaxation and focus, which then allowed me to find a curiosity and interest in physics, which I had not previously felt. So I thought I would also um, give you a couple of examples of the, the, this kind of skeptical comments. I honestly thought that these contemplative practices would be less interesting, but I'm very happy to say that they have been a wonderful experience. They reminded me of the reasons why I love science and that I should not stop asking questions about my surroundings. And of course, they helped me see the many applications of the physics concepts that we learn in the classroom in a more personal way. The fact that all I needed to do was to relax and truly observe and appreciate nature made the experience very enjoyable. And this is the last one. I was really skeptical going into this assignment. And by the way, this I think is more common. I think this is quite common, even though not that many students said this exact, said it this way. Jaded by past practices of mindful meditation in high school assemblies and office visits to, to a gastroenterologist with altern, alternative methods, I approached this assignment as just something I had to trudge through and check off my to-do list. Coming out of this experience, I was surprised to find that I actually enjoyed this assignment. Not only did this assignment force me to take a much needed, albeit previously unknown, to be that it was necessary break, they're not getting <laughs> graded on their writing, um, but it also revealed many ways that I interact with physics in my everyday life. So these are kind of the, the nature of the comments that we got in um, a lot of these, uh, these reflections. And um, I'm gonna, I'm, I, I would like to show you two videos because we also have, remember that we had a, a video assignment. So here's, a, I'm gonna show you two. Here's one, I hope these work. It's not hard to know. This is on restoring forces. So remember they were asked to just look for examples of some physical phenomenon in their everyday life. Oh yeah, there's very dramatic. <laughs> Often comment to my students that these videos, the best videos, are extremely mundane. Now imagine having to watch a hundred of these. It's not not super fun, but I think that's the mundaneness of the videos is kind of the point, right? Because they're looking for physical phenomena in the mundaneness of their everyday lives. But for them, it's important because they are really seeing examples of things that we talk about in class. It's not different. It's not that exciting. It's really just everywhere. Um, and then I'd like to show you the most artistic one that I ever received, and this is about um, optics and, and light and shadow.
Okay, so let me um, sum up. I'm going to say just some, some some general things about about uh, this work that we've done. The first thing that I think is really important to to talk about is what is the role, what is the specific role of the meditation in these results? Because you might say that you know if you just ask students to look around and look for physical phenomena around them, when you accomplish the same thing? And I think the answer is actually no. Um, and, um, and, and here's what, what we were able to deduce from, from the feedback that we got from the students. So the meditation component contributed in, in two major ways. The first is that by prompting them to take pause and eliminate distractions, it allowed students to achieve a state of mental openness for the contemplations that followed. So basically the, the meditation set the stage for the contemplation itself, the look around and see what kinds of phenomena you can observe around you. Um, and that's important and especially, you know, it's, it's really kind of shocking how many students, and maybe not that shocking, it's, it, it's um, but how many students talked about how rare it is that they put their phones down, right? Because most students are glued to their phones all the time. And here we ask them specifically, put that away and that alone um, was kind of a first step. But the second step is, well, have you ever tried putting down your phone? It's extremely stressful because we're so used to staring at it all the time. So the meditation, pro the meditation practice actually allowed the students to settle, settle down and achieve some state of mental relaxation and somatic relaxation that allowed them to then take these next steps because we're really asking them to stay away from all kind of technology for, for 30, 45 minutes. And then the second thing, which is, which is unsurprising, um, but still interesting, is that the student's identification of physical phenomena, both in the kind of more classical mechanics um, example, as well as the electrodynamics one, is that it closely followed the progression of the guided meditation. And I showed you, I gave you an outline of the somatic meditation. And so, um, let me just do it from the example of the electrodynamics. You know, first they're they're seated, they feel their weight against the chair, they go into their bodies, they pay attention to their heart, they're they're paying attention to their sense of hearing. And many students talked about things like um, what how are macroscopic forces like friction and normal forces, how are they connected to, to microscopic things like uh, uh, the repulsion between electrons and so on. Um, and, and what is the role of um, electrical signals in the heart and in the nervous system. So we're literally guiding them through their bodies and they're also identif identifying phenomena within their bodies. So these are two ways in which I think the meditation played a, a specific role. And then just to conclude, some, some kind of broad impacts of the practice that uh, I think are very interesting are, um, first of all, the goal of the practice of, of this the study was to deliberately draw the student's attention to physical phenomena in their surroundings in order to um, expand the student's awareness of the connections between the formal physical principles and uh, personal experience. That was the original motivation behind the work. And in fact, we do find that to be, uh, to, to, to hold true. But also by drawing students' awareness into their bodies, the practices um, allow students to naturally and meaningfully relate physical principles to chemical and biological systems. And finally, and, and I think this is worth stressing quite a bit, is that the practices had a notably positive impact on the student's somatic, affective, and cognitive states. So let me just say a couple more things about that, because we know that there's kind of a mental health crisis in our universities. Students really are extremely stressed, they're very anxious and the universities can't always support the needs of the students. I've now been to several extremely wealthy universities at Northwestern. There were, I think, I mean, fewer than a handful of mental health counselors for the entire student body. I had a student who came to me who had experienced a sexual assault. She called them, she called counseling services and they couldn't get her an appointment until two months later even though it was an extremely serious and traumatic event for her and there just weren't the resources. Not to say that like a contemplative practice can fix that, but I think it speaks to, you know, the, the needs of our students uh, in especially these trying times. Um, what can we do to help support them? 
And I think we have recognized, and there's a lot of research about how meditation in particular can help support students' um, well-being. And of course, not just students, but uh, but in all kinds of other fields um, in society. And but um, even though I think, you know, these these assignments that we gave the students, they were one-time thing. So we can't hope that we can't expect that they are going to have a lasting effect on students' um, kind of uh, psychological and cognitive well-being. However, it can alert the students to the fact there is great potential there. And in fact, there are quite a few students who uh, establish a regular meditation practice following these activities because they realize, oh, wow, this is something that I'd like to, to include in, in, in my life. And they went on to either come to my meditation classes or ask for additional resources to do these practices on their own. So I think there's, um, there's a lot of potential here for these practices. You know, I've only been doing this for a few years and it's very new work. Um, and especially um, there has been quite a lot of work done on contemplative practices, you know, in higher education, but not specifically in physics. And in fact, less so in sort of hard sciences than in the humanities and in religious studies and so on. And I think there's great potential actually. Um, and, and I'm curious to kind of hear I'm going to end here, but you know, I'm curious to hear what what you think. You know, if you're if you're teaching, is there room for this in 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 your classes? Um, if you're a student, is this something that you'd be interested in trying out? I mean, I'm I'm so it, it open to to feedback and questions and comments because um, uh, because again, this is kind of early stages in this work, but but it is really fun and and I think the biggest surprise has been the students' openness and appreciation. For um, these for these kinds of practices, and many of them say in their reflections, you know, I never would have done this if I didn't get credit for it, and I realized that it was extremely worthwhile, and I can't believe that I was getting credit for sitting in a chair and paying attention to physical phenomena around me, and um, that's really a pleasure to, to hear from them. So let me let me finish there, and um, and yeah, take any comments or questions or any kind of feedback um, that that you'd like to offer. Thank you, Zosha. Um, so uh, this is a good opportunity for, you know, folks, anybody to ask a question. If you wanna ask a question, just unmute your mic and start speaking. And if there are too many people talking at the same time, I'll try to moderate. <laughs> Let's do it that way first. I have a question. This is reading. Um, I got my video on. Here we go. Um, interesting presentations, I saw. That was very nice. Um, so, do you think this is broadly applicable to undergraduates in general? Uh, obviously, I'm sure this is not anything specific to physics, right? But it's just the mindfulness is something that might help all undergraduates. And do you have plans to kind of expand this within your university or? Yeah, I'm personally, I'm always thinking about ways to expand it and especially into, um, you know, graduate classes as well, because, uh, because I think there's room for it there as well. And like I said, from a kind of topics perspective, um, there are a lot of people who are really interested in kind of uh, quantum mechanics and the confusion that that stems from learning quantum mechanics and how do you work with that in a contemplative way? Because uh, you know, it's it's funny because back in the '60s when quantum mechanics was become, becoming a sort of hot topic, there were there was all kinds of talk about the relationship between physics and consciousness, right. and, and, and people and. It, believe me in my sangha, there are a lot of people who are not physics experts and they're constantly asking me questions about those kinds of relationships. Right. And I think you've got to be careful, like, what are we talking about here? Like, are we talking about how to use contemplative practices in the classroom? Or are we using contemplative, are we using contemplative, are we using quantum mechanics to understand consciousness and kind of vice versa or something? I don't know. Right. Um, but I think there's, there's great potential there for sure. Right. I think, I think it's also within the hard sciences, physics is much more abstract. Yeah. Than any of the other hard sciences like chemistry and biology, you know, there you can actually see things. So being contemplative in that physics sense actually makes sense because it might help you to 
to kind of grasp the more abstract concepts better than you would if you didn't have broadened that mental horizon. Yeah. So what's really fun uh, in going to these conferences that are organized by the Association for Contemplative Mind in Higher Education is that people come up with all kinds of creative things. So one contemplative practice is beholding. And beholding is, is a kind of concept that comes more from art and, and beholding art, right? You sit in front of a painting, right? You go to a museum and there's a little bench in front of a piece of art and you sit there and you behold right. the image and you, and, and you pay attention to what arises in you in response to this piece of art. However, there are people in, uh, specifically in, in chemistry, because there are some publications around this, but I know other people are trying it, where in a chemistry class, they are projecting a graph of the potential energy versus distance of some kind of a molecule. Okay. Now, normally you project this thing in your class and you say, here's the potential energy of the, the, the atom and the whatever, the two different atoms in the molecule. But here, what this particular professor is doing is she's making room for silence, first of all, silence as she projects the graph and then allowing students to really look at the graph. What are they seeing? What questions arise? What confusions arise? Because we speed through material so much that we don't really make room for that. We don't tell the students, we say, oh, do you have any questions? No, okay, moving on. Right. But actually, what if you were beholding this graph? And it sounds kind of silly, but she's found that the students ask extremely thoughtful questions if you make room for that kind of practice in your classroom. So yeah, I think there's room for this kind of a thing in any subject. And I think the, the bigger questions have been, is there room for it in STEM fields? And I would say, absolutely. People are thinking of all kinds of fun, fun ways to do this. There are great studies in ecology, um, contemplating sort of humankind's right. impact on the environment. I mean, really, it's, yeah. I mean, many of these things are bigger than ourselves or yeah, exactly. The way we have evolved to think about things, you know? Mm -hmm. So we are facing these big catastrophes at a planet level. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard for us to contemplate at that level when we had essentially evolved to worry about what's going on within 100 meters of you. You know, is there like a leopard coming or is there a rival man coming? Yeah. I mean, that was our evolution. And, and exactly. here we are facing climate change and, and it's such a difficult thing to contemplate and it absolutely goes, goes into abstraction, right? And it's worth contemplating. It's really, right. really right. And you're kind of undoing a little bit of, um, you know, the information dump that can often happen in the classroom where everything is just, here's information and you got to memorize it. Right. Okay, that, all of that is important. I want my students to, to memorize certain things as well, but also how is it landing for you? You know, how does it connect with, with what you're thinking about and, and right. what you're feeling? And yeah. yeah, we don't make a lot of room. I saw that Jeff had his hand raised. Jeff, did you still have a question? Go back in and go. Your <laughs> it's, it's actually Jeff's wife, Maggie. Oh. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> I, uh, sorry, sorry. Let me see if I can get myself um video where's how do you get on the video uh oh all right my question is um i teach classes for um both future teachers elementary teachers um in math and um and um uh, courses for developmental math um for for students that are needing to you know catch up in their in their mathematics and i think this is, would be really great uh, for them. And I'm curious how um, some of your um, practices might be used, especially during now when you're, they're having so many Zoom meetings. Um, and um, in particular for students who are, um, I don't know, they're telling us now, don't do a lot of Zoom meetings, do a lot of, you know, recorded things that they can do at their own time. But I feel like they need to be present with each other, even if it's on Zoom. And then I'm thinking they could pause it, go outside, <laughs> you know, do these um, meditations, come back and like, 
I'm wondering about the juxtaposition of the of the meditation part and the learning part in class, um, whether that goes right together or whether it helps to say, okay, I've learned some things in theory and now I'm gonna go um, take a break and I'm gonna go outside and see how this deals with practice. Like what's that, what's the timing of that? And I don't know, anything you can say about um, how it's worked during, any of this has worked during the COVID times. <laughs> Yeah, so I think you're bringing up a really, a really, um, you know, timely issue now that we're just constantly stuck in front of the, the computer and, you know, there's so much Zoom fatigue and, um, you know, pre-record, there's a lot of value to the pre-recorded lectures and especially for English language learners who can pause, slow things down, get subtitles. I mean, that kind of thing is not possible in, in, in kind of real time in, in real life in the real classroom. So, you know, there are some good things, but um, to speak more specifically to your question, I think there's room for both, um, kind of doing things uh, within the context of a particular class period, as well as um, after or before a class or a unit or whatever it may be. I, there are some, I know there are some people who begin every single one of their classes, their class periods with a short meditation. And it could be, you know, a minute is a long time if it's quiet. So this is not, we're not asking a, a big time commitment in terms of giving up precious class time. A minute could be plenty to just sit, pause, like, like close your laptop, do, do whatever, turn off your phone, and let's just sit for a minute in silence. What I found both as a meditation teacher and as a, as a, as a, as a professor of physics is that guided things are a little bit better than, than just kind of co complete emptiness. It's, it's really helpful if you can start and say, okay, kind of following the little script that I had, you know, sit on your chair, feel the weight of your body. So, you know, that maybe- That was actually one of my questions. Is there an app for that? <laughs> you're a, you're a trained, uh, trained person in this. So like we were there, like, oh, there, there, probably an app for that. <laughs> yeah, but there are great recordings actually that you can find online. And, you know, if you send me an email, I can send you some, some suggestions. Um, but doing guided things is really helpful so that people stay focused um, and kind of following along because a minute of, of silence is, when I started meditating, I could sit for about two or three minutes. And then it was like, my brain was screaming at me, like, you've got to stop this right now. And then it builds up and now I can do hours. But but that was a long process because our, our bodies and our minds are not used to that sort of thing. So the guided part can be really, really helpful. Uh, so you can do that in the context of a classroom, or you can do what I've done with a lot of my students is giving them a handout and like read through the handout and then keep it next to you as like a physical printout so that you're not going on your phone all the time and follow that. And then all they have to do is like glance at it and they can uh, follow it along like at their own pace, which can also be really helpful. So yeah, in the classroom, I think, um, yeah, I think both can be really helpful, I guess. I've, I've done both and especially um, doing in-class things around exams can be really helpful. You know, students are freaking out so much. There's so much test anxiety. And I'm blown away by, you know, some of my highest achieving students here at the University of Chicago. They're amazing. And they are ex about exploding with test anxiety, even though we all know for a fact they're going to do really well. They're going to go, they're going to leave here and do great things with their own, but they don't see that. They're little anxious balls of energy. So to get them to kind of pause, get into their bodies, find their breath, I think can have a huge impact on their, their cognitive performance on an exam because their bodies are more settled and they're not allowing that adrenaline to kind of take over their entire, um, their entire brain. So, um, so yeah, I would try, I would try both. And, and the great thing in working with teachers is then you're kind of disseminating these practices. One of the things that I, that I really recommend um, in, in, with, with people who wanna try implementing these things is always do the practice yourself several times before leading students through them because you never know what's gonna come up and it's really easy to read them and think you get what's gonna happen. But you might realize like, oh yeah, this part is really challenging and this part is really easy and I might need to give a little bit different guidance here than I thought. Um, so going through it, I would say like between five and 10 times on your own before you ever try this in the classroom. 
for me, it's easier because I also teach meditation. I don't think you need to be a meditation teacher to try these things. I think you just need to have some familiarity with the practice and then you do it with your, and then you do it with your class or, or people that you work with or, or whatever it may be. You mean just like preparing for class, right? Like teaching. <laughs> Ideally, yes. We're going through it a few times first. <laughs> you should know what you're going to be teaching next. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And you can't always be, you know, an expert in everything that you're teaching, but you should have enough familiarity with it that you can preempt some questions and have some answers prepared when students ask you things. Exactly. I also wanted to ask, did you ever have students that just totally blew this off? Never. Oh, interesting. Okay. I just... I have, actually, I have one, I have one slide. Let me see if I can find it. And, and, but mostly you did it with students who are kind of higher, high achievers. Yeah, but you know what? I, and I don't know, it really depends on, on your students, but if you give credit for something, most of the time students are going to do it. And especially if it's not that much of an effort, like they're asked to write I tell them like about a page, but it can be less than that if they want to. And some really do just submit a paragraph. Um, I think I think this is usually worth 5% of their, their final grade and all they have to do is try it. So it's basically five bonus points. And, um, and yeah, I've never had a student not turn it in. Um, I do have one, I, this is a quote from the only student I've done this now for, for six or seven years who really just like was not about it. And this is what, what he said. Overall, I'm not really sure that this experience really helped deepen my connection to physics or science or the world or anything like that. Sitting down and taking a moment to clear up your head can certainly be relaxing, but it hasn't really led me to having any deep insights regarding physics or anything else in life, really. This is the most negative feedback I ever got. So yeah. <laughs> Our students are, you know, many of the students, you know, brown nosers, and they're not going to be too rude, but they do, you know, yeah, they're overachievers, but they're, they also have no problem questioning. I, I, I regularly have students tell me that they didn't like assignments because, you know, the questions were too repetitive or this problem sucked. It took too long. They seem to have no problem giving me harsh feedback on, on things I assigned to them. So I think they would tell me if they truly needed it. And, uh, and nobody has done that yet. Because, because again, it's, it's kind of low effort. We're just really just asking them to sit, pay attention to their bodies, expand their awareness, and contemplate the phenomena they observe. And it's, it's not that, it's, that's the great thing. It's so simple, um, but, but it's also kind of um, revolutionary in a way, right? Like we don't ask students to do this enough. If I may, I think that statement right here is so fascinating because isn't the intent when you clear your head, not necessarily that you get deep insights about something else, but that you get deep insights about yourself, mm -hmm. so that you're more fully present yeah. and open yeah. to what you're facing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that the openness itself is actually kind of the objective. That has been one of the challenges that um, that we have is, you know, a fresh crop of students who are so excited about being bedside nurses and the doing, 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 and the tasks and the interventions and, you know, the adrenaline and saving lives and uh, nursing is a science, but it's also an art. And the art side of it is what we need to spend more time on so that they can fully show up with clear heads. Um, and be present for the patients that they're serving. Yeah, that's, that's a challenge. Yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, just on a personal note, my my best friend just finished a nursing degree. Um, she's a psych nurse, and um, and we talk a lot about um, about meditation, mindfulness, and uh, just hearing a lot of the cases that she works with. You know, really, people. Um, going through really, really challenging times and how difficult it can be to be present with them and how much a meditation practice can help work with all of the emotions that can arise in you in response to what they're going through. Um, and also, but to, to process a little bit, right? Because it can be really overwhelming to take on, um, you know, the, the emotional states of, of these, uh, of your patients. So yeah, I think there's a lot there. And in fact, uh, uh, meditation practice, you know, has, 
meditation practice implemented beyond kind of the, the religious context really started in healthcare and working with people um, with mental health issues. Um, and, and so that's kind of, that's, that's a big part of where it started. Now, of course, it spread to, to sports teams and businesses and even like the military and, and they're like, are we really using meditation for the right reasons? I don't know, it's you know, a different question, but it's really been implemented so broadly now. And, and one of the places that I'm really happy about is in, in um, uh, correctional facilities, because I think it it's, uh, has a lot of power there. Um, and um, yeah. Well, thank you everybody for joining and having a you know, lively discussion. Yeah. Let's thank uh, Dr. Kruzberg as well. And you know, we can stick around for a little bit and if uh, there are other questions, but I think um, I'd like to draw this to a close. Yeah, and feel free to, if anybody has any questions, feel free to, to email me. I, you can find me easily on, on, the, on the internet. I, I think I had a quick question. Um, uh, as a civil engineering student, you know, I, I graduated um, last year from undergrad, and I'm thinking back to my freshman year and uh, freshman physics and all that, and the nightmares, you know. Um, <laughs> how do you make how do you turn this type of thing into you know uh how do you in, implement these types of things into like a regular curriculum that people can roll with every day because i i just remember not being one of those students like in in the survey you had that didn't identify physics you know or i had to work extra hard to to i don't know understand the physics i was learning and and uh implement in my personal experience so how do you how do you work with that yeah, like how would you um, integrate this broadly into the curriculum, not just as like a one-off thing? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Like how, I, I mean, at the freshman, you know, I've talked to Bujo about this before, sometimes where you have, or Dr. P, I'm sorry, sometimes you have, um, you know, really um, passionate physicists coming to teach this class, and then you have a bunch of, you know, undergrad civil engineers who you know, probably don't care that much or at, you know, we think we don't at first. Um, mm -hmm. So how do you kind of uh, implement it in that sort of a curriculum where, you know, it really can benefit the students, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, I think, so this is, um, this is such an important question uh, that I think we all kind of should reckon with and we probably don't enough is kind of motivating all of our students and and it's it, it's 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 really challenging because there are going to always be students who come into our introductory physics classes and they're they're super excited about physics they're determined that they're going to be physics majors and they do end up being physics majors and they just go on and they do it but that's not actually most students in our introductory physics classes far 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 from it Right. And uh, in fact, I, I can't remember what the percentage is now, but I have it in one of my papers. Um, it's an extremely small percentage of students in these introductory classes nationwide who go on to study physics. Most people take it because it's a requirement either for an engineering degree, for medical school, for whatever it may be. They're taking physics classes because they're chemistry majors. And I think. Um, something like this can certainly play a role because what you're asking them is forget, first of all, forget things like Gauss's law and, and, and people who teach physics will understand, right? Like Gauss's law itself, I'm a physicist. I never use Gauss's law. Like why should we spend so much time focusing on Gauss's law? It's totally insane. But it's not really about Gauss's law. And this is a really important thing for us to, to to um, get across to our students is that it's not so much about Gauss's law itself. You can forget about Gauss's law once the exam is over, right? But there are other things about learning how to work with Gauss's law that are extremely relevant, right? Because there's a lot of problem solving strategy that we teach that is uh, extremely transferable to other fields. And I've taught a lot of engineering students because at Northwestern, um, we had very few physics majors and a ton of engineering students. And I always told them what you should be focusing on in your physics classes is not so much the physics itself, but focus on the problem solving skills because that you can take with you into all of your engineering classes. It doesn't matter what it's about. 
But can you think about, you get a problem that you've never seen before in your life. How are you gonna approach it? Well, there are basically four steps to a problem solving strategy, no matter what you're doing. One, understand what the problem is asking. B, devise a plan for how you're gonna come up with a solution. I can't remember if I said one, two, three, or A, B, C, but three, <laughs> um, execute your plan. And four, check your solution, right? No matter what you're doing, these are the basic four steps of any kind of problem solving process. So if you can train yourself to constantly implement that kind of a problem solving strategy, you're training yourself, whether you're gonna be an engineer, a chemist, a biologist, a physician, no matter what it is, you are, you're training yourself in solid thinking. And you know, in, if you read about kind of the goals of a liberal arts education, we often talk about critical thinking and problem solving skills as broad goals of our education. But in practice, it's often memorization and regurgitation. So let's go back to well, what are the actual, um, those broad goals and how can we be more explicit about them in our classes? And there, I think for students like you, who you're not gonna be a physicist, but you still wanna think like a scientist in your engineering work, that's what we should focus on. And then let's be honest, who cares about Gauss's law? I don't care. Like, and I'm a theoretical physicist. It's still like a super elegant theory, but it doesn't matter that much. But learning to work with it and work Gauss's law problems is extremely relevant. So I think that's the approach that you take. How are you using this class to be a better thinker? Yeah, I appreciate that. No, it's a great question. Well, thank you again, Zosha. Are there any other questions? Anybody else? Which well, thank can... you all so much for listening and for your, your thoughtful questions. I really appreciate it. It's great to meet you all. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. I appreciate you coming here. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you.